The video game nostalgia wave is moving ever forward. With the remakes of Silent Hill 2 and Resident Evil 4 on the horizon, I predict this nostalgia wave will lodge itself firmly in the 2000s for a while, before inevitably moving on in a couple of years. Think about it, in the early 2010s, everybody and their mothers were making 16-bit something or others, obviously harkening back to games of the early 90s. Then, for the latter half of the decade, indie devs aped the low-poly cardboard aesthetics of games like Quake, Half-Life, and pretty much anything else that came out in the late 90s. It only makes sense that this trend will move forward and that we'll be seeing a lot of games released looking like they belong on the PS2 in the coming years. I grew up on the PS2, so I'm naturally more favorable to that generation's aesthetics than I was to the SNES, Saturn, N64, PS1, or PC games of those days. That entire paragraph basically served to set up the very loose connection between the nostalgia wave headed towards the PS2 generation and me talking about the game I love most dearly from that generation, Bully. Bully is the gaming equivalent of what I imagine unconditional love feels like. If you're not down for watching me make fuck me eyes at Bully for the next hour, there's the door. If you are down for that, however, grab a drink, get comfortable, and come along as I take you through, probably, my favorite game ever. I'll just go through the story and discuss things as they come up. I'll also try to cover some interesting, well, interesting to me anyway, bugs, exploits, and beta stuff as we go. Also, you might be curious as to why I'm not playing the Scholarship Edition. I own it, and I wanted to use it, but I'd heard so many stories of it being a nightmare to run on Windows 7. I use Windows 10. Software doesn't age like wine, so I figured there'd be no chance of it running smoothly, if at all. I did have a plan to install it and try and play and it'd be a whole thing like whoa guys look it's so broken but it just ended up working flawlessly in fact i genuinely couldn't believe it aside from it crashing when i set the resolution to 1080 and clearly it was never meant to be played at this scale it worked perfectly by this point though i was already like halfway through the game on this totally legitimate ps2 copy so i wasn't about to start over that's fine though in a lot of ways i enjoy the foggy paper craft aesthetic of this version over the enhanced edition anyway so before i waste any more time let's get into rockstar's forgotten but not really classic bully We assume the role of Jimmy Hopkins, who is basically Holden Caulfield minus the height, stupid hat, and being unbearable. Enrolled now at Bullworth Academy after being kicked out of like 17 other schools, we find ourselves at the bottom of the social totem pole. It's evident after being on campus for about three seconds that nobody likes Jimmy, and that will have to earn their respect, mostly through bare knuckle brawling and shenanigans. I consider Bully to be Rockstar's swan song for the PS2 era, ignoring Vice City Stories because it basically already existed, and Manhunt 2 because suck my dick. I hesitate to say it's their most technically impressive game for the console, but it did feature Rockstar's most alive world at the time. There's not a single character that isn't named. You never see any duplicate students or faculty. There are only four named prefects in the game, so you can only ever be chased by four at one time. The students, of which there are 61, all have their own names, personalities, and alliances. Of course, this is only possible because the game's scope is so much smaller than a GTA's would be, but it works perfectly for what the game's trying to achieve. Throughout the school year, you really do start to remember all the students' names naturally like you would in reality. We meet with the head of the school and are told to stay out of trouble. I respond to this by sliding down a railing and immediately clobbering a girl. Oh. Fuck. After making a tactical retreat, I find myself being accosted by the bullies outside of the boy's dorm. I obliterate him after fooling him into believing he had the upper hand. Russell, the bully leader, then makes himself known and is about to do the same to me before a teacher breaks us up. We head inside the dorm and it's here where we meet Gary. Fuck Gary. Regardless of how I feel about Gary though, we have to follow him around and do as he says because all Rockstar protagonists suffer from incredibly low self-esteem. Here he introduces us to the socialization system by making us bribe Russell. The socialization system isn't super deep or robust, but it offered a lot more than other open world games at the time, and some now. It's easy to see how it influenced Red Dead 2's conversation system as well. Anyway, we then break into Russell's locker, steal back some chocolates, get sexually assaulted, and are formally introduced to all the cliques and their respective leaders. The nerds are your stock 80s movie nerds. What they lack for in brawn, they somewhat make up for in cunning. The preppies are the socias from the outsiders, the greasers are the greasers from the outsiders, and the jocks are a clique made up of raging wildfires and letterman jackets. After this we're told to go to class, though you can play hooky. I wouldn't recommend it however, because classes in Bully do provide you with substantial bonuses and buffs. Chemistry, for instance, allows Jimmy to get firecrackers, stink bombs, and itching powder from his room the more you progress through the class. There are benefits to going to class, so I don't see it as a bother, even if some of the minigames are a bit uninspired. After chemistry, we have gym class. Going to the gym this early in the game is fucking terrifying because the aforementioned jocks are incredibly strong and quick to anger. Get used to hearing a lot when you start out. 
Gym class is either wrestling, which is basic, but extremely useful as it teaches Jimmy new moves, or dodgeball, which increases Jimmy's slingshot accuracy. Later on, Gary has the brilliant idea to provoke a potentially incredibly dangerous homeless man living on campus. Gary and Petey, hi Petey, are scared off, but Jimmy isn't phased. The homeless guy offers to show Jimmy some new fighting moves in exchange for a radio transistor. We get it to him, and he shows us the fabled uppercut. Job well done. When we get back to the dorm, a nerd, Algy, says he needs our help. Another nerd, Bucky, is trapped in greaser territory and is in desperate need of assistance. I arrive, unleash hell on them, and get Bucky to safety, but not before he bestows a gift upon us. A skateboard. The skateboard feels incredibly janky to use, but it was a late addition. Near the end of development, one of the Hauser brothers recommended that the dev team should implement the skateboard so that the player would have something to traverse on in between having to get a bike or just huffing it everywhere. As awkward as it can be to use, I really can't imagine the game without it. An eventful first day on campus is finally over. Day 2 gets off to a flying start as we're introduced to errands. See, Bully doesn't have side missions really. Instead, we can run errands for random students and townsfolk. They'll approach Jimmy asking for a favor, and you can either accept the request, insult them, or just ignore it altogether. Petey asks us to bring a package to Beatrice. Nothing comes of this. I have some time before class, so I decide to do a mission. That bitch entails Jimmy taking back nerd Beatrice's notes from cheerleader Mandy's locker and leaving a stink bomb for her as revenge. Mission complete, and now Beatrice likes us. Sorry, Pete. I get back to school and I need to help leader nerd, Ernest, at his campaign speech. Ernest's running for class president opposite of the jock leader, Ted. His speech will be hijacked by the jocks unless Jimmy stops him with a slingshot. We do just that and get some nerd respect for our troubles, though our jock respect drops. Plus five points to you if you took note of the Halloween decorations around the school. Immediately after Ernest's mission, I rush to the boys' dorm to start Halloween. <laughs> Gary's dressed like a Nazi, I wonder why, and Jimmy's been given a skeleton outfit. Halloween is literally magical as it stops the passage of time. It consists almost entirely of taking random students' requests for pranks. Slap a kick me sign on someone, trip somebody with marbles, stink bomb some students, etc. The game probably feels more alive during Halloween than any part prior or afterwards. Almost every student dresses up and it's fun to see all the costumes. Anyway, after you've completed five pranks, the big prank unlocks. The big prank is essentially a very elaborate version of that prank where you light a bag of shit at someone's door and ding dong ditch them. It's a good deal of effort for a not so great reward. Also, just in case it wasn't apparent how much of a lunatic Gary really is, he scoops the dog poop up with no gloves. Another day down. Why'd she leave me? Why? We gotta help Gary again, but don't worry, it's the last time. He rambles on about some bullshit and tasks us with beating up some bullies. I guess this is to incite Russell, but, I mean, given Russell's intellect, I don't really think this was necessary. We work our way through the school's basement, single-handedly solving puzzles because, you know, protagonist, and eventually Gary leads us to The Hole. Fun fact, The Hole was originally going to be a fight club and free room that you could participate in directly or place bets on. The bookie's table is still there in the final game, too. Anyway, Gary's convinced Russell that Jimmy said some unkind things about his mom and those barnyard oh, animals. What? Spoiler alert, Jimmy beats Russell and swears revenge on Gary. With Russell pacified, I could be forgiven for thinking my troubles at Bullworth were over. But this place is a rotten onion. Peel off one stinking layer, and there's another even smellier one beneath. Chapter 2 opens up with the head telling Jimmy to help the cook for some reason. Something about humility. The bullies are pacified, and the preps are our next target. We're invited to their boxing gym, but before we can engage in giving and receiving CTE, shop class. Shop class gives you better bikes, and the minigame's inputs work properly about maybe half the time. I guess we didn't pacify the bullies enough, though, because those bastards stole Melvin's, Grottos, and Gremlin's character sheets. An embarrassing chase, for me, ensues. To get the last sheet, Jimmy has to get kicked in the nuts before then kicking the other guy in the nuts. A true test of metal. We get the sheets back to Melvin and pocket a cool ten bucks. I decide against my better judgment and go and see the school cook. She's delightful. We have to go around town and pick up a few things for her. Her laundry, a razor, and some meat. Oh, they can't all be winners. After I finish the errand, I run from the school to my bike lock up, see that I have a new mission available inside the school, and pedal right back to the school. A good use of my limited time on this earth if I do say so. The English teacher's a drunk and the math teacher's not having it, quite frankly. I want to take a moment here and acknowledge the game's stunningly real portrayal of the difference between math and English teachers. Hatrick, the math teacher, is a colossal dick who only looks out for himself, not extending any sympathy to Galloway, the English teacher, with his drinking problem. 
Galloway, despite his demons, is a cool, understanding dude who teaches an invaluable subject while Hattrick has an ego the size of himself and has that ego inflated by teaching a subject that, beyond basic algebra, isn't useful for 99% of the population. Listen, I'm just saying, man. Gen Ed sure as shit isn't intent on producing the next great American novelist, so why the fuck do I have to learn set theory and negations? Galloway asks Jimmy to retrieve his empty liquor bottle scattered around campus before Hattrick can show the head. Jimmy agrees. We collect the bottles, some of which would have taken a great deal of effort to hide, and hand them into Ms. Phillips, the art teacher. She then walks away with the crazy, dangerous homeless guy. I never understood that. We receive a camera for our troubles, which unlocks the photography class. Next thing on the agenda is getting in good with the prep's main and only girl, Pinky. We find her waiting in line for sequel, the movie, and are tasked with clearing the line so she can be first. In a stunning and brave move, I steal one of the preppy's bikes and am immediately made to regret it. Whatever, I ruffled their feathers and they're not in line anymore. It only took being clotheslined off a bike and running away like a huge pussy. Next, we have to get Eunice out of line. She's real entitled and demands I give her a box of chocolates to even be worthy of her attention, because as much as this game takes place in 2006, it also takes place in 1957. I run to the store, buy some chocolates, hand them to her, and escort her to a secluded spot while one of the jocks in line says something weird. Miss Phillips sure has nice feet. In the alley, Jimmy is once again manhandled by Eunice. She can't keep getting away with this. The last two in line, the aforementioned jock and a bully, are pretty easily scared away because how dare anyone see you be gay in the mid-2000s. No, but seriously, bully is pretty progressive. There's a guy in every clique that Jimmy can kiss, and male adult peds can be seen holding hands in free roam. Anyway, now that we've cleared the line, Pinky can see the movie, presumably alone. Mission complete. Before the day is over, I decide to take on the preps boxing challenge. The purse is one million dollars, but not really. I tear through all the preps and win the tournament. Instead of giving me the prize money, though, they give me a new safe house in the form of an abandoned lighthouse, which clearly isn't abandoned because games have no idea how property ownership works. It's a cozy little place, though, so I retire there for the night. The next day gets off to a roaring start as I'm tasked with getting this guy some toilet paper. I agree and go to retrieve some for him because I'm a good person. When I return to the bathroom, oh, what a surprise! It's former WWF world champion Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I try to throw the toilet paper over his head and into the stall, but end up pegging him square in the face instead. I come to the realization that the only way through this is through it, and so I proceed to lay the smack down on his candy ass. The prefect sees my awesome fighting, dislikes it, and grabs me. I resist, and now my trouble meter is in the red. I'm in trouble, hence the name. See, when your trouble meter is filled up two-thirds of the way, you can break away from any authority figure's grip and flee. When it crosses over into the red, they'll immediately bust you if they grab you. That's what I'm in danger of. Truth be told, I have no idea why I didn't just hide in a trash can or locker, but hey, hindsight's 2020. I am able to throw the guy's toilet paper though, because as has been established, I'm a good person. English class is up next. It's an anagram puzzle, but if you pass, it gives you all sorts of social buffs and useful interactions. After classes, I meet up with Pinky at the movie theater again. Carnival Date is one of the best missions in the game. It's basically filler, but I like slice of life stuff. So. This is how you treat a girl? Well, not me. What are you talking about? We had a date, and you are three minutes late. No, we didn't. Yes, we did. No, we really didn't. But look, I remembered how much you liked flowers. Oh, damn. That wasn't you. That was Darby. Darby is Pinky's cousin. I don't know, something about old money. Jimmy swoops in and asks her out. We agree to meet at the carnival. How'd you guess? She gets a blistering head start on Jimmy, but we meet up with her eventually. From this point onwards, it's entirely up to you as to what you want to do. You just have to earn enough tickets to be able to buy Pinky a stuffed bear at the prize tent. In the middle of our date, Pinky fetishizes Jimmy's social class. You know, I've always been strangely attracted to the socially disadvantaged Jimmy. I play a super stiff game of baseball, test my strength, and dunk a dwarf. I get Pinky the bear, and her and Jimmy share a kiss in the rain. On the way back in town, Jimmy's so excited he attempts a backflip on his bike to little success. I figure I've got some time for one more mission, so I start the infamous panty raid. I hate to be that guy and say, oh, you couldn't do this nowadays, but I really don't know if you could. I mean, you're stealing underage girls' underwear for a pervo gym teacher under the thinly veiled guise of it being for laundry day. I don't know, maybe you could get away with it and most people consider it to be one of the less problematic aspects of the game in retrospect. I don't know. Regardless, the mission's great. It's essentially Metal Gear Solid, but instead of trying to stop nuclear warfare, you're stealing panties. It's funny, too, because the girls whose laundry I'm stealing don't really seem to mind all that much. Jimmy skulks around, trying his best not to be detected, and they're just like, Oh, hey, Jimmy, what's up? I like you, Jimmy. Sweet! At the end of the mission, Jimmy's caught by one of the students who thinks the appropriate thing to do is pull the fire alarm. The attic door is closed, so I have to escape out the front. In front of everybody. 
Oops. I escape by the skin of my teeth and give Bert in the laundry. Reprehensible. I retire to the dorm for the no Hey, wait a minute. The boys at this school outnumber the girls like six to one, but the girls get a spacious, luxurious two-story dorm with showers, toilets, and an attic, while we're stuck with this one-story dingy piece of shit. What gives? Well, development time, I guess. Or resources. The boys' dorm was supposed to have a second story, but it's not super clear why it was cut. If you stand far enough away and zoom in on its LOD model with the camera or slingshot, you can see the cut second floor. Okay, now off to Dream World. First thing on the chopping block today is art class. Avoid these things while you complete the lines. Simple, but I am confoundingly bad at it. Art class allows you to kiss better. Basically, every art class you complete gives a buff to how much health you gain from kissing a girl. That's a mechanic I forgot to mention. Kissing girls gives you health. Also, the more art classes you complete, the less you'll have to do to get a girl to kiss you. At first, you'll always have to give them a gift, either flowers or chocolate, but by the last art class, you basically just have to approach them and ask. The main benefit is that, by the end game, this can double your health. Anyway, then it's on to the prep boxing gym, which- You know we can't associate with you until you wear some proper clothes, huh? I guess this is as good a time as any to discuss Bully's clothing system. As you've probably noticed, each clique wears different attire. The Bullies wear the basic white academy shirt, the Preps wear aquaberry sweaters or vests, the Greasers wear leather jackets, Jock sport athletic wear, and the Nerds don astronomy club vests. There's also the unaffiliated non clique students that wear the school's generic dark green sweater. Different cliques will treat Jimmy differently depending on what he wears. Preps will make snide remarks if you're seen wearing something low class, vice versa for the Greasers. You get the idea. Bully wasn't the first game to do this, of course, but I I do like the differing responses Jimmy can get depending on what he dresses as. Anyway, Tad says we're not dressed appropriately, which, like, up yours, dude. We have to get some prep threads. We do that, and Tad lets us in on his plan to egg Hatrick's house for how he treated Galloway the other day. I'm fucking here for it. There's also this great exchange. Sure. Are you English? Well, no. I just speak this way because I'm very insecure. You see, my father is a self-made man, so I pretend to be old money, but in fact, I'm really nouveau riche. But less about me, dear boy. In addition to the obvious outsider illusions with the preps versus the greasers, there's also a bit of the Great Gatsby with all the insecurity of being old money instead of nouveau riche or whatever that fucking book was about. Anyway, we get the eggs and meet the preps at Tad's house. Here, Tad confronts Jimmy about things that Jimmy never actually said, and out of the shadows, Gary swoops in to escalate the situation. It's weird though. Gary's the central antagonist, but Jimmy barely acknowledges his presence here. Oh well, we've got a fight on our hands now. I beat the preps decisively and skedaddle, but not before Biff, the incredible hulk of these inbred Avengers sees fit to destroy my being. I love the fighting in this game, but it becomes infinitely more fun the more moves you learn. As of this fight, Jimmy's moveset was pretty limited. I know that Bully's combat was basically lifted from the Warriors, but I never played that, so I can't really compare the two. It only makes sense that Bully's hand-to-hand -hand combat is so satisfying, though, since it's such a huge part of the gameplay. I arrive on campus once again and start the diary, another Beatrice retrieval mission. Just stop losing your shit, girl. Her diary was taken in class, and in it she detailed her crush on Jimmy and how he'd write her poems or something. Despite having already kissed her, Jimmy cannot allow this to get out and vows to steal back the diary. I love the nighttime ambiance in this game, with this gif of some crows flying overhead. I also love the low-key gothic aesthetic the campus has that's highlighted more after dark. Anyway, we have to break into the school through a back window. Inside, it's Metal Gear Solid again, just with higher stakes than stopping all-out nuclear war. I retrieve the diary, exit the teacher's lounge, and am immediately spotted. Awesome. I shake him, though, and get the diary back to Beatrice. Before I can retire to the dorm, however, I'm given a request. This little girl wants me to egg the boy's dorm. Sure thing. I do the job and am then requested to egg the girl's dorm back. Because I have no alliances, I agree to do this as well. It's past curfew, so I have to stay out of the prefect's line of sight. Unfortunately, this guy wasn't buying it at all. I get rid of him, but because life isn't fair, I guess, another one spawns right behind me as I start egging the dorm. No problem again, though. Jimmy's faster than the speed of fucking light. Jimmy also gets extremely tired at 1am, so it's good I was able to make it back in time. Good night, world. The next day gets off to a phenomenal start as Jimmy enters a bike race to flex on the preppies. They never stood a chance. Later in the day, I go to pick up my trophy. Preps can't leave well enough alone, though, and steal said trophy. Ricky, the greaser in the store, lends me a hand in dealing with them. They come spilling out of my lighthouse, but Ricky and I have no trouble beating them into unconsciousness. Boys will be boys. The rest of the day is basically taken up by me racing go-karts. Beyond the UI being completely busted, I can't really think of a way to make this interesting, but it will pay off later. 10 out of 10 day. I start off the next day by wedging a preppy. I go to check up on Russell, but oh look, it's former WWWF world champion Bruno Sammartino. The convenience store clerk asks how my egging with Tad went. 
Poorly, I tell him. The grown man then suggests that we go and egg Tad's house while his parents aren't home. I'm irresponsible and dangerously impulsive, so I do just that. I throw an egg through every open window while Russell provides ground support. I do eventually meet my match in Biff, though, who's more a monster truck in a sweater than he is human. I make a tactical retreat. The fucking police show up for some reason, and I hightail it out of there. I get $15 for my troubles from... Well, I don't know, and take a bus back to school. Uh, nothing to make me feel like I'm having a stroke more than English class. The biology teacher sends for me. He wants me to kill lead prep Darby Harrington's plant. I disguise myself as a prep, a ruse that should fool absolutely no one, and find my way into Harrington House. I kill the plant in the most exciting way possible and fight my way back out through a horde of preps. Job well done. On my way to the safe house, I'm asked by Christy to escort her to her dorm safely. Because I'm a gentleman, I agree to walk with her. On the way there, Christy hits Jimmy with some of the stupidest fucking gossip I've ever heard. I hear everyone is betting on the jocks this year. I swear she got a nose job, and she's like only 12. It's totally not cool. Do you ever start a rumor about yourself? School elections are always rigged with money-changing hands. Did you hear there's fresh blood on the floor of the hole? Have you ever spread a rumor that wasn't true? Whatever, we get her to the dorm safely and retire for the night. Almost nothing interesting happened the next day until I got my hair cut and decided to kill the preppies. Winter is coming and they need to be dealt with. Jimmy challenges Biff to a boxing match and wins, obs, and then Darby sicks his boys on us. We fight through a crowd of condescension and ugly sweaters until we get to Darby's boss room. This boss kinda sucks. Darby will hide behind the bar and set his boys on us in waves while occasionally jumping in himself. I was getting my ass thoroughly spanked, but I did manage to fight through all the waves. And then Darby just sat there, behind the bar, impervious to my attacks. I tried everything. The slingshot, itching powder, breaking tables until I finally realized, like a dumbass, that there were these massive glowing stonking door bars that I was supposed to lower. That's why I got my bread buttered by like 70 waves of dudes. Once I finally sealed the room off, Darby came out and fought. I dispatched of him pretty quickly though and celebrated humbly. Who's the boss now? I can't hear you rich kids. Who's the boss now, my waspy little friend? Uh, Answer the question! You are... Louder! You are... Uh, That's right! Me! Now you girls, learn to play nice, you understand? On to chapter 3. Now, Darby is really stupid, malevolent, and rich. So it will surprise none of you to discover in a future life, he'll end up in Congress. But this is my story, not his. With the trust fund babies under control, it's time to turn my attention to their sworn enemies, those greaseball kids. It's Christmas time, and Jimmy's informed by Ricky Ed yeah, that the grease alita Johnny Vincent needs our help. Hey, forget about it. Okay, I'll stop. Jimmy tells him to beat it. I love winter in this game. The overwhelming whites, grays, and cool blues make for a great backdrop, and it's a way more enjoyable way to experience the cold than what's happening in the real world. No joke, and I don't know why, but I spent most of the day shopping for winter clothes. The next day was Christmas, and it really is the most magical time of the year. Time ceases, it's March yet again, and Jimmy's mom even sent him a present from her cruise ship somehow. Before I go and get it though, I'm tasked by a child to blow up a toilet. All in a day's work. I'm not sure how Jimmy's mom sent him a present from her cruise ship, but seeing as this is the most stylish piece of outerwear I've ever seen, I'll let this plot hole slide. Evidently, the other students don't share my appreciation for high fashion. The rest of the day was spent go-karting again to some of the most bumpinest music ever recorded. I won't talk on it much because my words simply can't do it justice, but Bully's soundtrack is just the hardest thing ever. Sean Lee, its composer, deserves all the joy and money in the world. Anyway, as Jimmy celebrates winning one of the street course races, he drives off screen and freezes the game. Thanks champ. I lose an hour and a half of my life trying to get back to where I was, but Bully's incredible so I'm not going to be too upset about it. I pick up roughly where I left off and I'm asked by Johnny, greaser leader, remember, to get pictures of his girlfriend, Lola, cheating on him with a prep. It's interesting to note though, Johnny says this, Look, meet me at the underpass in your new Coventry tonight. When like, bro, we're literally already there. I get the photos and hand them to Johnny, confirming his suspicions. Sorry about your crumbling relationship, man. After this, Johnny tasks us with baiting the prep here so he and the greasers can ambush him. 
Getting the preps here was an ordeal. First I almost kill them on their bikes, and then I fall off mine when the door doesn't open fast enough. Whatever, inside we beat the absolute tar out of them. I head back to the dorm and retire for the night, bruised and battered after falling off my bike and taking a firecracker to the face. The next day is Christmas all over again, thanks again for crashing the game last time, Jimmy, and I consult with the nerds in the library. Ernest tells me that Algy's in a tough spot on the rough side of town, but he doesn't know where exactly. I'm gonna have to ask Cornelius where Algy is. I find Cornelius being accosted by the Greasers and Gary, and okay, wait a minute. It's so weird whenever Gary pops up throughout the game, because he's the main antagonist, but Jimmy barely acknowledges his presence. I get that it's supposed to be like he's pulling strings from the shadows, but how? Motherfucker doesn't even attend classes, so how does he become Crabble Snitch's successor? Unimportant inconsistencies and the plot aside, Cornelius and I break some greasers and he tells me where I can find Algy. I meet up with Algy in greaser territory and find him and some prep both trying to break off a piece with Lola to no avail. Lola's sluttiness is not beholden to any sort of logic. The greasers confront us and so we make a daring escape. I ride on the back of one of the bikes and fire my slingshot at the pursuing greasers. The preppy takes the most inconvenient route to the school imaginable, but we arrive all the same. I set off an explosive because I find it funny, and then I meet with the preps. They convince Jimmy extremely easily to vandalize the greaser's territory. I travel to New Coventry, the greaser's territory, and hit him with the most creative insults I can think of. Gems such as, it's not rebellious to wear a leather jacket and have dumb hair, greasers suck, grease balls, and my personal favorite, grease bags. If an actual 15 year old was tagging here, I feel like there'd be a lot more allusions to sucking dick. Somebody is gonna get their freaking lights knocked out! The greaser's reading comprehension fails them again. I decide I need another safe house and so I decimate the greasers living in this old sports bar. Property acquired. Great job, Rockstar. First order of business today, destroy the math teacher's manhood. After that, photography. Ms. Phillips tasks me with taking photos of homeless people and dogs in New Coventry, which feels exploitative, but hey, anything for a good grade. I managed to get a good photo of Clint Eastwood here and return to class. Next thing on the agenda, bike race. I disrupt a lover's quarrel and Johnny says this. Looking for you, Johnny. At Lola's house? Yeah. In the middle of this street? Anyway, Lola flirts with both of us simultaneously before issuing a race to determine who gets her. I catch Jimmy rubbernecking and then we're off. Long story short, Johnny never stood a chance. Jimmy then makes out with Lola within earshot of Johnny because he's an absolute dog of a bloke. Later on that night, I met up with Lola under the underpass. She's looking to canoodle, but Jimmy's having none of it. Though I find it a bit rich that he says, Sorry. Haven't you caused enough trouble? When he's been actively participating in said trouble. Also, like my guy, Jimmy inevitably falls for Lola's wicked charms though and agrees to fetch her belongings from the greaser's headquarters, an abandoned tenement building. Inside, I find that most of the greasers have become victims of transorbital lobotomies because that's the only reason I can think of as to why a lot of them put up such weak defenses. Like, look at this shit. This guy does nothing but stare at me while I take aim directly at his head. This guy alerts his buddies before running away, stopping, and turning his back to me. And this guy just stands gormlessly like a mannequin while I charge him. Anyway, we fight our way through the building and eventually come across the token black greaser armed with a massive fuck-off sledgehammer. The ensuing boss fight is incredibly easy because he never charges you and all we need to do is back up and take pot shots with the slingshot. After defeating him, we make use of the sledgehammer to break down walls and reach previously locked off sections of the building. Though I think it's a bit of a missed opportunity we're never able to use this thing against some of the greasers. We get Lola's stuff back to her and tangle tonsils because, as was established, Jimmy's an absolute dog. We retire for the night and Jimmy sleeps like a baby despite all the pain and suffering he's caused. On the way to school in the morning, I decide to shatter a random person's car window for literally no reason. The last chemistry class is up and I ace it. I don't have to attend the class anymore. It's genuinely kind of sad when you start to wrap up classes in the game. We're nearing the end of the school year and the story, and it's incredibly bittersweet. There's a real feeling of melancholy for me. Graduation's coming up fast, and I don't even know what I want to do with my life. Will the bonds I've formed last? Where will I end up, and will I be happy? Time to see the cook again. She needs me to get some stuff for her for her upcoming date with a chemistry teacher, yada yada yada. It's not very interesting and it ends with her date raping him in a mission that I always put off. So, yeah. Galloway's drunk again and tells Jimmy that Hattrick's trying to get him sacked. As much as Hattrick has a point that maybe a teacher shouldn't be constantly drunk in class, he's an asshole about it, so fuck him. Also, fuck math, you pompous dickhead. I still haven't found an everyday use for the Pythagorean theorem. Jimmy trails Hattrick to his house and destroys a good deal of his property. That's... That's basically all that happens. The next day, I finish up art class, foolishly pick a fight with some jocks, complete gym class, and break through the map so I can do the last go-kart race and get the go-kart in my garage early. 
Okay, let me back up. Bully runs on the RenderWare engine, which powered all the GTAs from this era and a bunch of other games, like Loads. Because of the engine, there's a healthy amount of jank throughout. It's literally in the game's DNA. Bully is an incredibly easy game to break and exploit. Here are some of my favorites. Get on the roof of the greaser's garage, skateboard jump to the adjacent roof, and skateboard jump into the corner of that roof. Congratulations, you've softlocked yourself until Jimmy passes out at 2 a.m. This one's simple. Crouch, grab a student, and stuff them into either a trash can or a locker. Stand up and walk off a decline, and you should find yourself levitating. If you punch or switch weapons, Jimmy will fall, but you shouldn't suffer from fall damage. You can increase your height by walking up inclined surfaces. This next one isn't really complicated, but it's a lot more involved than the previous two. Find a trash can situated next to a corner like this. Walk alongside the wall until you see the prompt to hide in the trash can. Hide, turn Jimmy straight at the wall, and jump out. You should, ideally, be at least partially in the wall. Walk into it like this to test it. Repeat the process until you're completely embedded in the wall. With this, you can walk into classrooms you were never supposed to see the inside of, see backdrop transitional areas and other oddities, like the cut roof access stairwell which I managed to glitch my way into by just walking in through the door after another student. Bullies basically held together with string and hope, and although these bugs aren't really useful, I do think they're interesting to play around with. It's fun to see areas of the game you were never supposed to. Anyway, I win the race and get the go-kart like two chapters earlier than I'm supposed to. Sweet as. It's time to finish up the Greasers arc. Lola tells Jimmy there's going to be a big fight between the preps and the Greasers, and Jimmy takes it upon himself to insert himself right in the middle of it all again. I decide to exude some massive dick energy and confront some of the Greasers on my go-kart. I ask them where Johnny is and they won't tell. It's a fight. My big dick energy then immediately dissipates as I try to fight using said go-kart before being yanked off it. I beat all the Greasers hand-to-hand, -hand. Johnny confronts us, and immediately Judo throws Jimmy to the ground because cutscene Jimmy sucks. He runs and we chase him through a part of the map that doesn't actually exist outside of this mission. We're just about to catch him when his goons spring a trap on us and before we know it, we're surrounded. Pete's there though, and is able to take Johnny's bike from him with a high-powered magnet. From then on, it's an absolute massacre. Jimmy fells Johnny and tells him, I told you! I was the daddy! Got it? I'm in charge, you do what I say! Alright, I give up. You can have her. Who? What are you talking about, Johnny? Lola! You win! She's yours. This has nothing to do with her, man. I don't care. You can keep that slut for yourself. Despite... well, regardless, the Greasers are defeated. I'm starting to feel pretty good about myself. I've just taken control of two of the school's worst cliques, but I know there are bigger problems just around the corner. Problems with overdeveloped pituitary glands and brains the size of peas. It's spring now. The flowers are in full bloom and the snow has gone away. Jimmy and Petey discuss what's next. Petey recommends Jimmy become a male stripper before being knocked down by some jocks. Jimmy insinuates the jocks participate in communal shower orgies and vows to stop them. In general, not just the orgies. Jimmy tries to enlist the help of the nerds who, surprisingly, fucking hate Jimmy for basically no reason. Petey recommends Jimmy take down the nerds. Two for two on great ideas today, Pete. I ask these nerds where I can find Ernest, and boy do they have egos severely disproportionate to their fighting abilities. We have to head off to the observatory. We fight, and I use that term loosely, a squad of nerds on our way to the observatory through the woods. Upon reaching the observatory, we find Ernest manning a potato can. Cannon. How the school allows this, I have no idea, but we have to take him down. I break the transformer for the cannon and Ernest retreats. I then man the cannon and break down their enforced steel doors with the spuds, which begs the question of how any of these kids are surviving being pelted with them if they can rip through metal. No time to reflect on my violent actions though as we follow Ernest into the observatory. I then proceed to absolutely cheese the following boss fight. Jimmy defeats Ernest and the two form an alliance. I meet up with some of the nerds at the library just in time to witness Algy suffer a stroke. Oh, hey, Jimmy. Hey, Pete. Yo, Jimmy! I'm over here! Give me five, dude! Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, well, cat. Looks like your homies took care of some lames for us. <laughs> what are you talking about? Don't get fresh with your homies. <laughs> Can you please talk normally? This is my normal style of rapping, bro. <laughs> All right, enough. What's my quest? He tells me to go mess with some of the jocks at the Carnival Funhouse. We enter the Funhouse through a clown's mouth and find some nerds being beaten by some jocks. After dispatching of the jocks, we make our way through some obstacle courses. These do real damage and feel, at best, slightly out of place in a Funhouse. We take control of the mechanisms and stop the jocks as they come through, skewering and presumably killing them. Next, we make our way through a maze and onto another set of dangerous traps. Does Rockstar know what a Funhouse is? 
We take control of the traps again and thwack some jocks before finally escaping. I decide to take a roller coaster ride, alone, because Jimmy alienates everyone he comes into contact with, before finally retiring to my lighthouse for the night. The next day, Ernest tells Jimmy to take illicit photos of the head cheerleader. Jimmy inevitably goes along with it because as much as rock star protagonists hate everyone they work for, they hate themselves more. We take a photo in the middle of cheerleading practice, not even a good photo, then we sneak into the girl's dorm after her to take another photo of her in the shower. Now I know there's a lot to be said for leaving some things up to the imagination, but this is just absurd. And the last photo was just of her in her pajamas. Are the nerds really this starved? I take the photos to Ernest and lose some jock respect, which... You know, fair. Word spreads quickly, I guess, because later that evening, the jocks launch an assault in the observatory and we have to defend it. They do eventually break down the nerd barricades, though, and it's up to me to defend the castle with the spud cannon. In the process, I'm pretty sure I incapacitate more jocks than there are students at Bullworth, but before long, they give up and the nerds declare victory. Later on, Ms. Phillips sends Jimmy on another fetch quest. She says it's all for a date, and Jimmy takes this to mean a date with him. A greaser also eavesdrops on the conversation, so we have to deal with them attacking us throughout the mission because... Jealousy? I don't know. We get her perfume from the beauty parlor, her pearl necklace from the Aquaberry store, and her dress from some thrift shop. Returning her items to her, Galloway and Jimmy meet and discuss the date. Jimmy, somehow, still believes that Ms. Phillips is taking him out even when presented with conflicting evidence from Galloway. Galloway and Phillips depart shortly thereafter, leaving Jimmy befuddled as to how his teacher wasn't coming on to him and about to make herself a predator. I run over a jock in my go-kart to take my mind off it. I then meet up with Mandy, the head cheerleader who I was perving on earlier, and she tells Jimmy that her life's been ruined since everyone's seen the photos. Jimmy is nothing if not extremely fickle, and so he agrees to cover all the photos up. We come across the first photo and- wait a minute, I didn't take that. So it turns out there's a conspiracy surrounding this high school cheerleader involving multiple people taking and distributing illicit photos of her. That's not the actual plot, but yeah. We cover up some posted around the school before finding out that they're being plastered all over town. There's another one that I didn't take, depicting her taking a fat dump that some students seem to be really mesmerized by. We return to Mandy on campus and she thanks us by planting a big ol' smooch on Jimmy, the dog. At the observatory, Ernest tells us we have to procure the team's mascot outfit. I need to provoke him into chasing us, which was a pain, and then beat him in a fight in the old swimming pool. Genuinely one of the tougher bosses, which is weird since it's just a non-click student in a costume. Once we beat him down, we inherit the outfit minus the crazy power it apparently provided him. This sets up the ultimate plan to take down the jocks, but first, breaking our English teacher out of the insane asylum. Ms. Phillips tells Jimmy that Hatrick had Galloway commit himself to the hospital. Ms. Phillips asks Jimmy to break Galloway out, because I guess that's something you'd ask a 15-year-old. We Metal Gear Solid our way into and through the hospital, and eventually come upon Galloway drowning in his own misery. I must be a better person. I must be a better person. I must be a better person. Oh, God! I am pathetic! Hey, Mr. Galloway. Go away! I don't want to have another group therapy session with those people. If I have to pretend to be someone's mother one more time, I'll... Oh. Hi, Jimmy. Uh... What on earth are you doing here? Ms. Phillips sent me. She's really worried about you. Come on, let's get out of here. Oh, uh, uh, I can't right now, Jimmy. I'm late for my regression therapy as it is. It's fantastic. I've discovered I really do hate myself. Jimmy does convince him to leave, though, and he's able to walk right out the front door and into Ms. Phillips' arms. I forget that this part of the map is still blocked off and return to the school to challenge the jocks to a game of dodgeball for ownership of their clubhouse. I proceed to spend the night in the clubhouse. In the morning, I guess I must have been bored because I decided to travel into town and challenge the nerds at the comic book store to a game of Consumo for access to their safe house. I don't think Consumo's as bad as a lot of people say it is. It just requires unbroken focus for a few minutes. I get the high score, Jimmy misses the opportunity to name himself Ass on the leaderboard, and we travel back to campus. It just so happens that I have the last radio transistor the hobo needs, so I hand it into him and learn the legendary overhead punch. There's more moves that he's taught Jimmy throughout the game that I've glossed over, but they're not important. What is important is that after Jimmy learns the overhead punch and leaves, the hobo constructs a tractor beam and is taken into the sky, never to be seen again. There was never any doubt. 
No time to dwell on that, though, because it's time to start the big game and get back at the jocks. Jimmy interrupts Ernest while he's reading some peer-reviewed academic studies and is told to disguise himself in the mascot uniform and pull some pranks on the jocks. First, however, we have to learn the Bullworth mascot dance. The tune, if you want to call it, that plays over it every time it's performed is grating, and it gets real annoying having to do this every time you encounter a jock. The first prank is strapping a firecracker to a football and replacing the jock's real football with it. Funny how he didn't notice a fucking firecracker tape to the ball, but whatever. Next up is super gluing the benches. Here, take this glue bottle. It's full of glue. Go create a sticky situation on the team benches. It inconveniences a single jock. The next step is pissing in the jock's cooler. That... that's just genuinely disgusting. The penultimate step is sprinkling marbles over the football field. This doesn't make any sense and wouldn't really work in reality, but thankfully Bully isn't reality, so it works perfectly. The last prank involves reprogramming the scoreboard to read, Jocks play with their balls, a more devastating burn I've never seen. The Jocks finally realize something is up and confront Jimmy in the middle of their game. A football-themed boss fight ensues. Ted, Jock leader, throws the firecracker-strapped footballs at Jimmy. Jimmy throws them back at Ted's defenses. Ted retreats and the process repeats itself till Ted starts to run away at which point Jimmy has to sack him. We do that, celebrate in front of the entire school, and move on to chapter 5. So here I am, suddenly the king of the school. I never meant for things to turn out this way. I just wanted to control a couple of psycho kids and be left alone. But now I guess I'm certainly going to live the good life. Jimmy's efforts to unite the school and stop bullying appear to be paying off as everybody's getting along now. This newfound peace can't last forever though, as there's still the elephant in the room but not really because he's almost never mentioned, Gary. As Jimmy's basking in adulation, Darby suggests leaving a mark on City Hall so the whole town will know Jimmy's name. So I start the tag and... Ah, oh, crap. So I climb my ass all the way down and get some more spray paint, climb back up, and then finish the tag. People are miffed about it, but hey, what great artist isn't misunderstood in their time? It's convenient I say that because for the maybe, like, five minutes Jimmy was off campus, Gary spread a whole bunch of lies about him and single-handedly ruined his reputation. The first step to repairing Jimmy's reputation is to help the nerds out. There's a rat infestation in the library that we have to sort out. We do just that, and hey look, this barely legible PNG tells us that the rats were delivered in a box from Spencer Estates, Tad's dad's company. Hmm, the plot thickens. Hey, did you know that in Sweden, 20% of all road accidents involve a moose? At least according to this globe. Side note, this isn't what globes do. The next step in healing Jimmy's reputation is to help the jocks with their smoldering gym. Mr. Burton here accuses Jimmy of setting the gym alight, even after we helped him acquire underage girls' panties. The gall. Jimmy takes it upon himself to save those trapped inside. Anyway, Jimmy saves the students trapped inside and extinguishes the fire. Manny says she saw some skeevy guy downstairs. Jimmy goes to investigate and is steamrolled before he even knows what's up. Despite his failure to capture or even identify the perp, uh... Mission complete. Also, despite having just saved their favorite place in the world from burning to ash, the jocks still attack me on sight once I leave the gym. Later on, I decide to mend fences with the greasers. I come across Lola and Norton arguing under the bridge and come to discover that Johnny was taken into the asylum. We gotta go rescue him. So you remember how, like, three paragraphs ago I talked about getting Galloway out of the asylum? This is pretty much exactly the same thing. The only difference is Jimmy has to disguise himself as an orderly to break Johnny out. This place obviously isn't safe, so we get out as soon as possible. Once outside, Johnny tells us that he went a little crazy when some kids told him they'd been with Lola. That's weird, she's shown herself to be nothing if not faithful. After the mission, I partake in the towny challenge and beat the shit out of some kids for ownership of an old warehouse. At 15, Jimmy owns more property than I probably ever will in my lifetime, all without even having a credit score. I let the fact that I'm a failure sink in as Jimmy goes to bed. In the morning, we meet Zoe, a girl who got kicked out of Bullworth when she raised concerns of Burton being a creep. She and Jimmy then come up with a plan to get revenge on him. While he's taking a jog in the park, Jimmy breaks all but one of the surrounding porta potties. Burton must really have it out for Jimmy because he even blames the broken Johns on him. 
I mean, it was Jimmy, but relax, dude. Burton is forced to use this one precariously resting on the edge of a steep drop. Zoe cuts the chain attaching it to the railing and Jimmy rams it over the edge. Oh my god! Corn! I didn't have corn for dinner! Oh, this is off! God damn, I stink! I'm gonna have to shower for days with bleach! Ah, this is worse than when I got hazed! Never being one to miss out on an opportunity, after the mission ends, I take a joyride on the lawnmower. Surprise, surprise, it's slow as shit, so I abandon it and go help the preppies out. Their boxing trophies are missing, and, of course, they blame Jimmy immediately. Like, I can buy them being upset that Jimmy, their new boss, didn't prevent them from being stolen, but is Gary really so persuasive that he's convinced everybody that Jimmy's the source of all evil in the world? We head out to see what happened to the trophies. First stop is New Coventry to question the greasers. They plead innocent. They do, however, tell us that the townies were the ones who messed with Johnny, thus introducing our newest clique. The townies are a bunch of kids who were either kicked out of or never attended Bullworth, and they're intent on making Jimmy's life a living hell. We sneak through their warehouse and find them stuffing rats into a box to send to the school. We get all the photographic evidence we need, except not really, so I don't know why I said that. We go and also get a photo of them burning all the preps' trophies. We return to Darby and tell him what's been going on. I guess evidence is just a poor person thing, though, as he basically tells us to shove it. To get back, I make out with all their cousin. Returning to the school, we find Galloway drunk in the parking lot. I feel you, Chief. He tells Jimmy that Hatrick's been allowing his rich students to cheat on tests, so Jimmy vows to get photographic evidence. Snap, 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 done. Crabble Snitch is about to fire Galloway for his drinking on the job, but is so incredulous about what Hatrick's been doing that he fires him instead. Later on, I go to pick Zoe up in my sweet go-kart, but it's only built for one person, so I just drive alongside her as she huffs it to our destination. The objective of this date is as follows. Break as much stuff as you can, and whoever incurs a higher total wins. I win, of course, because Jimmy is an agent of chaos, and now Zoe likes him. Glad that's done. The next day, I'm made to see Crabble Snitch, and Jimmy starts off the interaction by immediately insulting him. Ah, Hopkins. Now, I'm not one to give in to popular sentiment. You can tell that by your clothes. What? I'm saying you dress great. Long story short, Gary's gotten in Crabble Snitch's ear and told him all about Jimmy's mischief. Somehow, without ever being on campus or attending classes, Gary's supposed to become the successor to Crabble Snitch, too. The argument ends when Crabble Snitch expels Jimmy, though Jimmy is still allowed to live in the dorm. To take my mind off it all, I peruse some of the most decidedly mid-2000s apparel imaginable before going to talk things over with Petey. He gives Jimmy a brief pep talk, and Jimmy sets out to recruit Russell and get to the bottom of it all. We find Russell sat atop a stolen police bike, ready to rain hell upon the townies. Unfortunately, the game takes away my go-kart and gives me this shitty scooter in its stead. Russell and I travel to the factory where the townies hang out, but it's locked up. Russell isn't beholden to the same laws or limits that you or I are, though, and kamikazes his way through the barricade. He then proceeds to chase after some cops, leaving us all alone with Zoe. We battle through the factory, beating townie kids and solving really weird train-based puzzles until we find ourselves in the compound having to chase down the townie leader, Edgar. Before long, we're engaged in a pitched battle with Edgar, involving metal shields and pipes. Fun fact, Jimmy was supposed to drown in acid and die if you failed this boss fight. Seriously, look it up. This boss is cheeks, but thankfully it doesn't last very long. Edgar ends up telling Jimmy that Gary was behind everything the townies have been doing, and Jimmy tells Edgar that they're gonna team up to take Gary down. Before that, though, a growing boy needs his rest. We wake up the next day feeling healthy and well arrested, and so we set off to start Complete Mayhem, the final mission. Jimmy begins to profess his love for Zoe before she tells him about all the madness happening on campus. Because he's essential, both literally in the mission and in my heart, we have to get Russell out of the meat factory. We do that and we're able to hide from the cops too. We gotta get to the school, all hell's breaking loose. We meet Edgar and some of the townies at the school gates. How are we gonna stop a load of kids from beating the crap out of each other? It's America! We go in there with threats and bribes until we get what we want. If all else fails, we beat the crap out of everyone. That's why I brought along backup. Russell likes to hurt people for peace. And with that, we're off to beat up all the faction leaders so they stop beating each other up. First, the preps. Darby still being a pompous prick, so I embed him in the stairs, a fate worse than death. Next, it's the nerds who have set up in the gym. Two-thirds of them are taken out solely by friendly fire. The jocks are next, and they're holed up in the library. 
This jock tanks a super kick square in the face, but we're able to take them down pretty quickly. The greasers are the last faction that need to be dealt with. For some reason, they've invaded the girl's dorm of all places, and geez, Johnny, are you all right? I don't even know what the point is of fighting him right now. I'm no moral avenger, though, and I certainly don't play fair, so I take the pain to him anyway. Now that all the factions are dealt with, Russell and I make our way to the school to confront Gary. Inside, we find Edgar standing over a bunch of fallen bullies, which Russell is surprisingly cool with. Jimmy tells him to go calm everybody down outside. Then, plot contrivances make it so that Jimmy is, for the first and only time, stripped of his slingshot by some prefects. Russell chases the prefects off, and before we know it, we're face to face with Gary once again. We chase him to the roof, get pelted with bricks while balancing on thin, suspended boards, dodge avalanches of cinder blocks, and avoid massive falling bells. Jesus Christ, Gary, I don't think you'll be appointed head of the school if you murder one of its alumni. We cut off his monologue by triggering their final cutscene confrontation. Well, you If I win, you're just another punk! You win, and you'll be sent away even quicker for beating up the head boy! Why'd you do it, Gary? Because I can! Because making little people like you and the morons who run this place eat out of the palm of my hand feels great! But I never did anything to you! You would have if I'd given you the chance! Face it, I'm smarter than you! Oh, congratulations! <laughs> you're smarter than me! You hate everyone, and everyone hates you! Genius! The head likes me! I tied him up, turned his dumb school into a battleground, got kids expelled, unfairly, put several others into therapy, and he still likes me! You're such a loser! <laughs> well, at least my mom doesn't make her living on her back! You're dead! <laughs> no! Gary doesn't put up much of a fight, but I'd expect nothing less of someone who's missing their spine. Following a kick by Jimmy, they both fall through the school's glass ceiling. Crabble Snitch heard everything and tells Gary's dead body that he's expelled. Jimmy explains how he took down Gary, with help from his friends, and has reinstated the Bullworth. When Jimmy exits the school, he's met by an adoring crowd cheering him on, comprised of mentors, lovers, friends, and the people he just beat the shit out of not ten minutes ago. Zoe rushes up the steps to meet him, and they share a kiss before the screen fades out on this incredible game. Man, what do I I even say, other than that it hurts me on a spiritual level that Rockstar will never make Bully 2. Oh, it's been in development a few times, dating back to 2008, but nothing's ever really come of it. It feels like ever since Red Dead Redemption 1 was about to come out, there were rumors that Bully would definitely be Rockstar's next game, and these rumors carried over to every other Rockstar release since then. I guarantee that after GTA 6 comes out, the rumor mill will whirl to life once again with dubious reports of Rockstar working on Bully's successor. Personally, I've come to terms with the fact that Bully's a one and done in Rockstar's catalog. I hate that, but I've come to accept it. Even though a sequel will never happen, that's never at the forefront of my mind when I decide to revisit Bully every few years. To me, Bully is unmatched in charm. There's just something about it. It's the last gasp of the PS2 era in my mind. Characters were made up of maybe 5,000 polygons, there was an intense fog to mask model and texture pop in, the audio had a slight crackle to it, and the birds weren't real, but that's why I love it. It's one of the last major titles to come out before games went through their brown period in the late 2000s through the early 2010s. It's so nostalgic for me, it's hard to put into words, but these graphics with this art style and the slight gothic tint, and it being such a perfect time capsule to a time I only remember vaguely, but incredibly fondly, I don't know, man. A lot of it probably has to do with me being a kid when it came out. This is what games looked like when I was a kid, before I was privy to the many ills of this world. Adding to that, it's inherently childish. It borders on adult themes sometimes, but not really any more in-depth than a child would understand. That's why I think setting a potential sequel in college misses the point entirely. At that point, why wouldn't our protagonist just murder, maim, steal, and commit other horrible crimes like it was GTA? In Bully, when Jimmy's out on the town, adults will tell him to go to class. You know what happens when a college student misses class? Classes, nobody gives a shit. The reason Bully worked so well is because it reappropriated a lot of GTA's mechanics to work in an adolescent context. Instead of shooting someone in the face with a gun, you being a kid with a slingshot. Instead of picking up prostitutes after dark, you walk a girl to her dorm. Instead of crazy illegal street racing, you race go-karts at the carnival. There's a clear distinction between what Jimmy does and what a GTA protagonist does. Setting a sequel in college would blur the lines and you'd probably end up with a mediocre mix of both, but with neither of the extremes which make them distinct. The most grim things in Bully are either very well hidden or just outright theories, which also takes me back to the time when things weren't really known. So hey, maybe there is a former student haunting the girls' dorm, or maybe Bigfoot really is roaming the hills of San Andreas. When I was a kid, this...
would genuinely unnerve me, and I'd be compelled to explore further. Now I know it's just an ambient audio file. It's weird that Rockstar put it here, but that's ultimately all it is. This all being said, there is a strong sense of Bullworth being an existential hellscape after beating the game. In something like GTA, it makes sense that the characters don't age at all. They're adults. They're set, mostly. In Bully, it's depressing to constantly see the same kids rush to classes that they'll never complete. Jimmy and his peers are all doomed to remain at 15 or thereabouts forever, never growing, never experiencing anything new beyond the quaint borders of Bullworth, and never being cognizant of these limitations. Post-campaign bully is depressing. It's stuck in the past. So, as much as I love coming back to it and experiencing a snapshot of the mid-2000s, it's not healthy. It's not healthy to live in the past, to be so caught up in how good things were that you never appreciate how good things could become or something. If you haven't, obviously, I'd recommend you play Bully. It's aged better than a lot of its contemporaries, and it's pretty cheap on basically every platform. It has a charm, style, and sense of humor that I don't think will ever really age out. It's equal parts timeless, and very much from 2006. It's Bully, and we love Bully. Bully.